morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Flynn. I'm a director of product marketing at Blue Code Systems. We're based in Sunnydale, California. This isn't a product pitch, so I'm not going to talk about I'm going to talk about different things that we're going to need to make, but I think it'll be very important. In what well, we're calling cyber I mean, many of us have, uh, within law enforcement, uh, the issues, you know, plans, contingency plans, when a natural disaster hits, boats, protect things when a disaster hits, and then sort of the ancillary issues of things like looting. And you've know, seen blackouts and things like that, or earthquakes and stuff, we've often seen um, uh, looting on a physical basis. We're going to talk today about that in a, in a cyber basis. Uh, and to help me out, I have Doug Leone and Pam Greeley. Uh, Pam, Doug, you want to introduce yourselves? I'm Doug Leone, the uh, ISO for California Environmental Protection Agency. I'm Pam Greeley. I'm the um, Information Security Officer for the California Highway Patrol. And so they'll be sort of the color commentators. Um, I'm sort of sitting here in the ivory tower, uh, sitting in Silicon Valley, saying, oh, you need to do this and this. These guys, like you, are sort of on the streets, so to speak, uh, and dealing with this kind of stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so with that, please let's have this be interactive. Uh, if you have questions through and in the course of the conversation and the discussion, please ask them. I'd much rather have that than us being pontificating. And you guys, you know, chime in as we've discussed. Uh, and I won't ask you any questions that would <laughs> that you don't want to answer. Or if, you, if I do, please go. No, you know, no, cut me off. <laughs> but please, let's have this be interactive. And we sat around, um, you know, and, and sort of formulated a disaster. But uh, the the notion in the introductory thing is a very interesting concept, and a lot of people don't do is get a baseline of what your network is doing and what your security is doing. We'll talk about this in some detail. But if you don't know what is happening on a daily basis, if you don't know what's normal, you have no idea what's abnormal. And particularly when everything is hitting the fan, so to speak, um, that's going to be a very difficult thing to understand and judge and then be able to fix. Prepare, make the plans, and sort of take notes of the kinds of things we're talking about here today. Deploy it, you know, sort of a no-brainer there. And in the course of an, an environmental uh, or a, a disaster kind of thing, obviously recover and then go back and check what happened while everything was going haywire. So nothing really surprising here. I mean, if, again, if you guys have anything to add, you know, feel free to chime in as far as sort of the issues here is about. Uh, but we'll get further into the technology. I think it'll be very your, your color commentary might be very interesting. We sat around on what would be a um, something that hits home and that is an actual possibility of a natural disaster. I thought it would be something like an earthquake. I think it was Doug, you mentioned, uh, well, you know what really worries people in Sacramento is the Folsom Dam. Um, and then I went on, I Googled around, and Noah uh, is saying that Sacramento, and this is me, this is Noah talking, not me, that the, the possibility of a Katrina-like situation is here in Sacramento. It's the dam, it's the levees, it's, you know, uh, pineapple expresses that last for days and days and days and days, and the scientists are saying in a historical record, those things actually have occurred, so maybe even a prehistorical record. So it's not a, uh, an abstract thought. And where we are here, uh, and Doug, do you want to talk a little bit about maybe sort of the infrastructure, the, uh, what you know, or Pam, as far as where the data center sits, what's there, what are the backups, and where sort of what would happen, you know, God forbid, you know, if the Folsom Dam or something issues there on the American River at 460 feet started hitting us, well, in Rancho Cordova at about 87 or in Sacramento, we're close to sea level here. Right. You know well, you know, many uh, state agencies have uh, determined what are their critical systems that resides in uh, Gold Camp, which is the uh, data center over in Rancho Cordova. And if they need uh, to ensure that there's availability for those systems, they've uh, they have, uh, have systems in Vacaville for backup. There's mainframe systems there in, in Vacaville as well. Uh, there's uh, Windows servers, you know, that sit there as a backup. Um, so it's just a matter of identifying those critical uh, systems that you need up within a short period of time, short time frame, making sure that you have those systems also duplicated in a hot recovery. And, and as a citizen, I'm glad. I mean, yeah. so. <laughs> and Pam, anything you know to add as far as uh, you know whether or not the CHP? You don't have to give any, any state secrets here. Uh, what's in Rancho Cordova, or what might be spread around in different parts of the state? Um, well, we have different offices throughout the state of California, and we have um, different technologies in them that support 911 and. Um, other emergency services that we're able to roll over internally, um, not necessarily at OTEC. 
So again, it's a, it's a, it's a, there are contingencies, yet, I mean, I think, turning to both of you, if the American River flooded and the Rancho Cordova data center hit, was hit hard, uh, let alone electricity failing, landlines failing, I mean, think of a Katrina kind of situation. I mean, it would be bad. I mean, it would not be, it would be a bad day. <laughs> it would be a difficult day, yes. yes. So, you know, with that, and then natural, you know, human beings, uh, will, and particularly first responders, will not be thinking about cybersecurity. Any kind of protections would start to go out the window. Like, no, I've got another job to do. But, you know, the issue of cybersecurity is going to be the last thing the first responders, and particularly like CHP people, I would, you know, be <laughs> very high on that list, would start to uh, think about. Again, I mean, what, what's your, Pam, I think, you know, you're sort of responsible for the security of the first responders and, you know, CHP being high on that list. What's your notion of sort of the psychology and sort of the, the awareness of cybersecurity issues among the rank and file within the CHP? Thoughts on that? Well, I think in general, our, our staff is very aware of security and protecting um, the state assets and information and providing public service to the um, citizens of the state. Um, so it's part of ingrained in, especially our, our front line, our officers. And, and, you know, and Doug, we were talking about, you deal with a lot of, uh, you know, scientists from the uh, university community, and which are, pre, you know, different, different culturally, uh, maybe, <laughs> than maybe CHP officers, but also in their approach to security and the flow of information. I mean, you want to sort of compare and contrast sort of what the CHP's approach is, you know, in general, versus the kinds of folks you're dealing with, which are the, the from the scientific community in many ways. Uh, that is true. I do want to point out one thing, that during a disaster, all these state agencies um, have essential functions that have been uh, uh, provided for in administrative orders. So every department should know what those uh, essential functions are in the administrative orders. And one of the things that um, is in our essential functions uh, during a disaster is uh, the environmental chemistry lab should be able to provide for determining if there's hazardous uh, substances in, in uh, doing some sort of tests. So if there is disaster, that lab is supposed to be uh, ready to provide for, the, for those. Sorry, to see if, if the flood, you know, what kind of poisons might be in the waters and what the drinking water right. situation is like and things like that. Right. Yeah. And one of the most, every department has communications at the top of, those, top of that list for essential functions. So we have to make sure that communications are up and running. Um, it is this opportunity for bad guys to do bad things. Uh, you know, this notion of cyber looting, you know, you hear a lot about this uh, state-sponsored attack, terrorist attacks, um, criminal attacks. The interesting stuff is it does happen, and I've got a couple of examples of this later. So as you look at this, the targets are going to be sensitive data, SCADA resources, first responder information, uh, fooling the general public, uh, trying to get in relief funds and sort of having, you know, sort of stealing money and pretending to be a, a relief agency and instead of that uh, sort of taking money. Uh, issues with, um, we've seen these kinds of things, with trying to spread havoc uh, and, you know, sort of commandeering Twitter feeds and Facebook pages of government resources and media resources has happened and we'll give examples of that. So the bad guys obviously would be able to do bad things and in an isolated circumstances, these bad things actually have happened. Uh, so we're not talking about a theoretical here, we're talking about a reality that people have experienced around the world. So the first thing uh, a recommendation for is, and, and, and Doug, you and I were talking about how the importance of this, is understand what's normal. Uh, what is the normal traffic? What is the normal behavior? What are your uh, fi uh, firewalls doing? What are your users doing? What's the bandwidth like? What's coming in and out? If you don't know what's the basic baseline, you'll have a very difficult understanding if something bad is happening or what, what else is bad is happening at that same time. So you have the ability uh, to, in essence, have a video camera, a security camera on your network. That stores everything. And how far back in time you want to go, how many terabytes of information you want to have, is really just a matter of your storage. So you have this ability to have a video camera of your network, understanding the traffic patterns and be able to go into the forensics of that, and then being able to go into before, during, and after an alert or some kind of serious situation has occurred, understanding what is, had been normal, what was normal before the, tra before the disaster, what is now happening in, during the disaster, and then afterwards in the cleanup is going, what has come back? What has come back to normal? What has come back to still weird stuff? Um, 
to use a technical term. Uh, and I mean, Doug, you, you and I were talking about this, and again, Pam, your, your insight is, is, is helpful as well. I mean, what is, what do you see as the benefits of this kind of analytics to, you know, big data understanding of the security perspective of well, what's going on? The analytics is essential. Uh, I've done analytics by system and by protocol so that if there is something going on, I can tell pretty quickly what is the difference, you know, what is, what is the system or the differences or by protocol, what is the differences that are going on during an incident? And so you can tell pretty quickly uh, where, where the, uh, the probable cause is. And again, with that, you're starting to be able to answer the questions of what happened, who did it, and how did they do it? Why is this IP address all of a sudden sucking a whole bunch of stuff off of my network? Uh, what systems and data were affected? Is it done? Uh, can it happen again? What kind of safeguards? And so strong, strong, strong recommendation is have these large big data analytics, not just of your network, but also the security functions and the traffic patterns and the security behavior of your network. I mean, Pam, anything to, to add to sort of this, this, the importance of that from it's your critical. perspective? It's if you, if you critical. If you don't know what your baseline is, you wouldn't be able to tell. You can't s sift it. You don't have a benchmark to measure it against. Particularly when everything is going crazy in Correct. the event of a, of a natural disaster. Any, anybody have thoughts, questions on this? Again, it's not a product discussion. We'll be happy to have colleagues here. We'll be happy to go into a product discussion on it. But, you know, this notion of big data analytics, a video camera in essence, a security camera for your network. Just like, you know, if there's a break in, or I mean, it's, you know, the, the metaphor for looting is here. If the looting happened, you go to the security camera and go, okay, what was it like before the, uh, before the looting? Oh, okay, here's this guy here doing bad stuff. Oh, I got pictures of them. Metaphorically, it's the same here for what you can do with large-scale security. It's more than just a SIM, a security incident uh, management. I mean, if you guys correct my, uh, <laughs> my, metaphor, my acronyms here. But it's, it's more of a meta level for that. It actually can suck in information from your SIEM uh, statistics. Because with the metadata, now you can start to be able to make management decisions. And SIEM is more like a phone, sort of like getting your phone bill. Okay, this call meant that call, this call went here. But don't have the metadata, don't have the pattern analytics, which is extremely important. So the next thing is, you know, what happens when the physical connections fail? So somebody's going out there, there's a natural disaster, it's flooding here in the American River. Uh, your headquarters are down. Uh, theoretically or possibly. You're setting up emergency ops centers. You've got your roaming users. You've got your first responders out in the field. The cell towers may or may not be there. They might have satellite phones being connected to their laptops, small bandwidth with critical information being able to be conveyed to and from uh, kind of situa uh, situations. I mean, you know, for you guys, I mean, do you see what kind of scenarios and what kind of implementations would you have for cloud access, for data access, in this kind of crisis situation where the headquarters might be under six feet of water. And again, metaphorically, sort of like what happened in Katrina down in, in lower Manhattan. Well, not Katrina, well, Katrina or Hurricane Sandy in lower Manhattan. Thoughts on sort of cloud access and you know, what a first responder might be able to do to still get internet access in sort of a, a situation that's not, you know, not pretty. Right, uh, well, we have, uh backup circuits and, um, you know, highly available systems for um, using different providers for um, uh, access to or um, to the data center. So if one uh, provider goes down, you, theoretically you should have access still. Sometimes that doesn't work. The, the best, you try for the best and then you just you Fingers try, crossed, to, try to figure, yeah, <laughs> improvements are necessary sometimes. Pam, any thoughts on particularly uh, first responders in a, an emergency where the, where the infrastructure might be either heavily damaged or, as we know it, non-existent? Well, for our agency, fortunately, our, our people on the front end of that, um, they're, they have other tools at their disposal to do their job hands-on. Right. It's, it's the administrative and the back staff that, right, at headquarters that, that would experience more of a difficult time. And so what you need to be able to do is have this kind of cloud access to the Internet with the same kind of security you might have in your, while, while you're sitting at a desk. And so what happens here is secure cloud access. So actually right now I have an agent on my laptop here. If I go to the Internet, uh, I am still being secured. Uh, per blue coats um, for, for my corporate um, approach. So it's a little agent. So I'm going off on the Wi-Fi here. I'm going out, technically I'm going out to a pop somewhere, probably in the Bay Area, 
and it has a gateway there, and it's saying you can go here, you can go there, you can't go there, you can go here, here's the kind of malware, if you start to download a file, it's going to be checked and stuff like that. That's happening for me right now as I go. And it can happen for laptops, obviously, smartphones, tablets, that same kind of infrastructure. So that's something to keep in mind is what, how are you going to have cloud access? How are you going to have secure cloud access to the information you need in, uh, the, in, on a day-to-day -day basis, let alone in an emergency situation? The other thing to keep in mind is data sovereignty. So there are, what you don't want to have is your information, particularly state information, in a cloud environment sitting in a data center in Tokyo or, God forbid, say China or something like that. You want to be able to have that kind of protection for data sovereignty. And so even when a user is somewhere else out in the world, that information still resides in the United States. So when I travel, I travel sometimes you know, in Europe or even the Middle East and places like that, my connection and my data is, even though I'm going to a pop uh, you know, here, the data is still residing in the United States. And I'm going back to the United States for that data. So in your cloud environment, keep that in mind. Data sovereignty is very important. Otherwise, I would be held to the laws of wherever I happen to be. And things like search warrants and judicial things and government actions could take place on the server that's sitting in China when I really want my information to reside under the laws of the US. And to point so, out, we have an obligation uh, at the state. We, if we have a contractual agreement with a, a software as a service or a cloud provider, we have to include in that contract special provisions, uh, the DGS uh, cloud computing special provisions. And in those special provisions, uh, the data must reside in the United States. And I mean, keep in mind also the cloud, the security of that, so the stuff that's in front of that, so that it also you want to be able to have that. So the policies and the controls and stuff are relative to the United States, as opposed to if I'm sitting in a hotel room in Tokyo, relative to the laws of, uh, of Japan or China or somewhere else. Pam, anything to say add or just well, Tapping on what Doug was talking about. So, uh, Procurement and contracts, you need to make sure you're educating your staff in those regards when these um, policies change and new products are available through OTEC um, that they're aware and include them. Now, something, a, a new technology that has arisen just in the last couple of years is something called, uh, you'll hear the acronym CASB or Cloud Access Security Brokering. What in essence is it's as the name implies. I'm sitting here. And I've got information from my corporation in Salesforce or I have a box. And what I want to be able to do is control that. And so the information is uh, and the access to the cloud and the flow to and from that cloud, both to the cloud or what we're calling in the cloud and for the cloud, is under, uh, under policy. Who here has ever um, just generated a box account on their own to share a big file with one of their colleagues? Okay. Uh, was that under corporate control? No. Nope. Um, should it be? I mean, I'm not putting you on the spot. <laughs> but, I mean, shouldn't you want to be able to have that control? I mean, Doug, you gave sort of an interesting uh, story of, uh, you know, where uh, the, the box company um, was looking at, and you can sort of discern all the box accounts that might be in your organization. Uh, you want to control that particularly with the kind of information you have. The users will do what they need to do. And in an emergency situation, they will do what they need to do to get their jobs done, which is sort of saving lives and property. A little sort of a to-do list for everybody here is to audit um, and maybe ask your whoever is providing your sort of software as a service is ask them how many and even who has set up accounts. You'll be surprised they're not under corporate control, the information there will be ad hoc. I've done things where, oh, I needed to send a large file to 20 people. It was a mega PowerPoint thing of 20 gigs. I wasn't going to email to them. I said, I set up a box account, and I set up a box. And here, guys, go here. And I go, oh, great, Kevin, thanks. Boom, boom, boom. That's not good security. Uh, so look at the functionality. And this can be done in the cloud as well, obviously. So when I'm sitting in a hotel room somewhere, I've got controlled access and acceptable use policies being enforced at the gateway. I avoid what we're called shadow cloud access, inadvertent box accounts, or access to things like Salesforce or others that are controlled so that this person can go here and that person can go there. And we're not just talking by password protection here. And then, very importantly, to that last point, encrypt and, and tokenize that data. 
so that the, what's in that box account is encrypted. So if somebody got to it who was not authorized to it and who didn't have the token, didn't have the encryption tunnel and key exchange to be able to look at it, we'll have just a bunch of gibberish. So it's relatively new technology called CASB. Uh, I strongly recommend everybody investigate it. Your users are setting up and doing shadow cloud accounts. Um, everybody, you know, one of the things, somebody says, well, we're not using the cloud. I go, well, you probably are. If you're using Gmail, you use, if anybody in your company is using Gmail, they're using cloud. They have set up box accounts. They have done things just to get their job done. They're not doing it for any nefarious reasons. Um, look at this kind of functionality inside both, you know, sort of for the cloud where it's tokenized and the back and forth to the cloud. You're going to have to gain control of your cloud access. Uh, whether or not it's on an official basis or sort of the shadow ad hoc functions that people are doing now. I mean, you guys, any thoughts on that or sort of the importance of this? Uh, right. Well, uh, departments should be assessing their level of, of risk regarding whatever compliance they need to, to be adhering to. So if you are, you know, CDPH, for instance, I know that they block access to uh, Gmail and Yahoo Mail, things like that. Uh, but if a department <laughs> doesn't have a lot of information that they need to um, protect, then they can allow, probably allow those kinds of uh, um, access to, uh, you know, uh, webmail. But um, it, it depends on a department's level of, of risk tolerance. And, and again, it, when we, every time we talk about security, the sort of the cultural uh, issues are different. I mean, what is appropriate for the users and even the psychology of the users in the CHP is somewhat different from a bunch of Berkeley uh, tenured professors as far as, you know, what you can tell them to do and what they can. I'm, I'm assuming so, but I, I, <laughs> yeah. I know some Berkeley guys and I know some people, yeah. you know, state troopers, they're different yeah. personalities. Right. <laughs> Maybe to, you know, to draw a broad stereotype. So look at what, you know, the functions of what a cloud access security brokering does. You can recognize control thousands of applications, so the Salesforce stuff, the broker, you know, the box things, things like that. Apply the intelligence in real time about the access to that whole bunch of different authentication schemes, uh, controlling access to sensitive areas of an application. You get to see this in Salesforce. You don't get to see that in Salesforce. Uh, applying data leak protection. What kind of information? The words social security or a, some uh, of a string that looks like a MasterCard account or so, you know, in the nine, or six, seven, eight digit numbers that look like social security numbers, not going to happen. It's going to be that kind of control to and from the cloud. So DLP comes into that, I mentioned tokenizing and encrypting the data so that what's sitting there is just gibberish to anybody who might be able to get in. And then content analysis, malware protection, so files downloaded, should that something be corrupted there, will still be inspected. Whitelisting, blacklisting, analysis, sandboxing, and things like that. So strong, strong recommendation on a day-to-day on a -day basis, but particularly in these kind of emergency situations where cloud access is going to be the de facto way that these people get access to the information. You need to have very tight controls. I mean, I mean, uh, next is managing critical resources. What happens, what's going to happen in an emergency is people are going to be on satellite phones, all, this, all your typical bandwidth, all your normal day-to-day -day operations will be different. Now, in the scenario we painted, it's going to be really bad here in Sacramento. But there's going to be people in LA, and government workers in San Francisco, San Diego, who are still going to be on the government network. What you want to be able to do is obviously have web access that's controlled. You're probably a control access. People aren't going to malware sites because that's blocked. People aren't going to gambling sites because it's bad uh, on the work day. They're not going to porn sites because that's bad. Uh, what you want to be, but they're still going to eBay. They're going to Amazon. They're going shopping. They're sharing photographs. They're going to Facebook and whatever. What you want to be able to do is set up a policy prior to the disaster that says when something bad, this is one of our contingency plans, is start to restrict who can do what on the network. It's not the time to go shopping on eBay. They may, it might be a sunny day in San Diego, but you don't want people starting to watch YouTube videos uh, at their desk or Netflix or whatever, which you might, might allow on a daily basis. I mean, Doug, we were talking about that sort of, you yeah. know, what, what do you, would be sort of some of the, the controls that you would play, sort of have that sort of contingency plan. And you can sort of tank, literally kind of hit the button, so to speak, and go, okay, stuff's hitting the fan. I'm going to plug, I mean, I'm going to sit in the contingency um, web access. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you initiated this discussion with me because we are expanding the level of UR filtering with the support of executive management. Uh, 
so there, we're constantly looking at the applications and the categories of um, uh, browsing activities that users are doing in our organization and tweaking them. But during an emergency, uh, an information security professional's job is not just confidentiality of data, but it's also availability of systems. And so how do you ensure during an emergency that your systems are available? And uh, I, I really love the idea of being able to, during an emergency, ratchet down uh, what people are able to do so that you can ensure the availability of your systems uh, first, because you may have a smaller uh, pipe during an emergency than uh, a normal situation. Yeah. And giving the priority to the, you know, not the hogging the bandwidth um, for the guys who actually have a really critical job. To do. I mean, Pam, anything to add to that or sort of similar kinds of well, if you, if you, if um, I, this kind of ties into the state agencies, the disaster recovery and business continuity, if you're testing your, those plans, this can be incorporated into that. I think that's a great idea to ensure, like Doug said, the availability of your systems. It doesn't cost anything. All you have is, okay, here's our access now, no gambling, no porn, no malware sites. Okay, now plan B is no eBay, no shopping, no photo sharing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then there's sort of, an, and to your point, part of security is, yes, things don't broke in, but also it's sort of the continuity and keeping things up and running. Look at bandwidth management. Prioritize applications. Right now, you may or may not be doing it. Uh, or maybe you are doing some, and you can sort of read this here as like, you know, this is like peer, the big red pipe there is peer-to-peer -peer communications, online gaming. Maybe you're allowing that, maybe you're not. But what you want to be able to, in an emergency situation, have this all planned out before, is hit the button, start your bandwidth management so that key applications are receiving the priority they need. Key e you know, email is getting its priority. It doesn't have to compete with somebody in San Diego uh, playing a game or having a FaceTime chat with grandma, uh, which is a fine thing to do. Uh, <laughs> but you don't want to do it and they, because they're not even thinking of that because they're in San Diego. It's a nice sunny day. The other thing is caching. This is critical information. What you don't want to do is have the 5,000 people who are out there in the field in an emergency situation all needing to go up and back and forth on the network for the same kind of thing. Cache the critical information. Cache the critical websites that are relatively static. These might be important videos, large downloads, uh, official communications. A real world scenario of this was a couple of years ago, one of the major banks had, you know, they have thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees. And Apple introduced a new version of iOS at 9 o'clock in the morning. Tens and tens of thousands of people all started downloading this multi-gigabit OS update from Apple.com uh, on their corporate network. And the guys, all of a sudden, the network is just it came down to a screeching halt. And this is a bank. I mean, this, needs, this stuff needs to work fast. It just came to a screeching halt, and they couldn't figure out why. And then they realized, oh, everybody's downloading, you know, going to apple.com to download iOS updates. So what they did, and they called us up, and our guys went out and sort of, you know, in an emergency scenario. What we did was we cached the iOS update. So that was sitting at the local network. They didn't have to go off over the WAN, chewing up bandwidth to download this thing. They could do over maybe at a, at a few different sites. Think of that in an emergency situation where you might want to have uh, a communication uh, that is the plan, or a uh, here's what we need, uh, you know, a video clip uh, from somebody at, uh, higher up says, okay, look at this, this is what's happening, this is maybe for internal communications. Uh, think about that. Plan on being able to deploy caching. Think of the kinds of things you'd want to cache in the event of an emergency as a contingency plan, and do the kind of bandwidth management to be able to say, okay, normally we can do this, but you know, our contingency plan in a disaster is this kind of thing. I mean, folks, anything to, to add for this kind of, uh, you know, uh, emergency planning? Uh, nope, I don't have anything to add. Pam, I mean, sort of, <laughs> it's common sense. I mean, it doesn't, but I mean, think of the kinds of things you'd want to have. I mean, maybe it's Jerry Brown having a video just for the employees uh, of this. I mean, do you want everybody going off, you know, on a satellite phone to view it? No, you want to have that cash at a local basis, as, a, as an example. So look at bandwidth management. One of the other things that happens in, uh, in, in an emergency kind of situation is you're going to be deploying all these new uh, restrictions and new policies. And so people are going to wonder, why can't I go to, you know, why can't I go to eBay right now? And they're sitting in San Diego because, you know, so it's not like they, you know, they think that they're causing an impact on what's happening here in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, what I, as I talk to IT people, they, you know, 
their, their help desk starts to explode. And people saying, the internet's not working. Which is, I mean, you know, <laughs> nothing's happening on the internet. The internet's not working. It's a silly thing, but inform the users. Have a little splash screen come up and says, you're not allowed to do this. There's an emergency situation here. And that comes up on the screen on their web page. I mean, on their, you know, on their, on their laptop or, or phone to say, you know, it's an emergency situation. This is, un, you know, this is not uh, mission critical functionality. You're not being able to allow to have that. It's a little tiny thing, but boy, you don't want your help desk to get calls from 5,000 people saying the internet's broken. How come I can't, you know, buy a book on Amazon during my lunch break? I mean, again, guys, thoughts? I mean, have you seen situations where users, you know, educating users or informing users mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, just a critical, just to, to make everybody happy? Right. With a possible estimated time of uh, completion or, or uh, downtime being uh, re resolved. So uh, if users are, are looking at a screen that says there's an interruption of service, they're just, you know, they may want to just go home. <laughs> but, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, if you have some sort of uh, update that says uh, hold on and, and um, we'll provide, we're providing services and then assure people that uh, your system will be up momentarily. Yeah, and Pam, any thoughts on the, the well, importance of We have, we have internal no notification systems with CHP so that um, all of our users um, typically know when there's an interruption, usually at any of our sites, Yeah, um, and, again, and then when it's cleared. It's sort of like when you're sitting in an airplane and the captain comes on and will be delayed and you have no more information than that, you just don't feel well. It becomes, a, well, there's a problem with this and we've got the engines and coming in and you, know, you just feel better. Uh, and sometimes psychology is a good question. Um, just a, really a comment when it comes to notifying your users that you have an outage or you do have um, you're restricting access for some reason or another that's out of the norm, having a phone number for them to call to get that exception access because I've been in a situation Very good point. where you have someone who is not in performing their normal role because of the incident, all of a sudden they need special access because they need to get to something. Good point. So that is, that's an important thing to put on there. Yeah, the exception, if you really do require this thing, please call 1-800, you know, help desk kind of thing. Very important point, yes. Um, the other thing is protecting public resources. The public and the press and the media who will be conveying the messages you want to convey out to the population will go to your web page, will go to your Twitter feed, will go to your Facebook page. Control that. Utilize web application firewalls is a critical function. This is your public web page. This is you know, california.ca.gov or, or whatever. Web application firewalls will stop common attacks, controlled input and output and access, detecting unfamiliar traffic patterns. Put in a web application firewall. You know, now as a strong recommendation. In an emergency situation, it's gonna be really, really, really critical because that's what the bad guys are going to do. They're gonna attack that. If I wanna wreak havoc in the state of California, I'm going to try to break down that web application and that web page. So web application firewalling. Look at the, the question of cyber squatting. Um, just as a, you know, I've been reading about these kinds of things, uh, cyber squatting, search engine poisoning. It's a real world scenario. In 2010, there was a major earthquake in Chile. What bad guys did was they poisoned the Google web search engines and set up phony pages. So that if you Googled, and I'm sitting in Santiago, and I, go, and I type in Chilean relief, the first page that would come up, or among the first pages, would be this bogus website. And people would click on it here, give money here, and this is how you can give money to the Chilean relief, you know, to your, to your friends and family in Chile. That goes off to the bad guys. The other thing is, is cyber squatting. I went, and this is kind of a goofy thing, on Monday, I just went to GoDaddy.com and typed in, Folsom Dam. See if I could buy a web page. Because if I was a bad guy and something bad happened in Folsom Dam or the American River flooding, I'd go, I'm going to make this web page up. It's going to cost me $2.99. $2.99. There's actually a sale on Folsom Dam News for $29.98, reduced now to $9.99. Um, I could buy that website. If I sent that out to the media, that would seem like a legitimate place to go. Strong recommendation, and I googled some of the names, uh, I didn't google, I go, went to GoDaddy and typed in uh, names of many California agencies, and I want to pick on anybody, and particularly even people at the front desk, I could buy names right now for $3. I can't buy a .ca.gov webpage, I can buy a .com webpage, 
Actually, stateofcalifornia.com is for sale for $68,000. I mean, if I had the money. <laughs> uh, but uh, other pages are $299. So sort of a, a thing I recommend everybody do is go to GoDaddy.com, just, just for kicks maybe, type in your organization's name. Is somebody, anybody doing that right now? And you can see what you can come up with. And you can actually buy a whole variety of names and packages. One, I would do that as a, to prevent cyber squatting now. I don't think you want to, there's the other one is California Attorney General's Office.com and California Attorney General.news. I could buy that for like a few hundred bucks. Do that and then be prepared in the emergency situation. You know, you're not going to go buying Folsom Dam info right now, but in an emergency situation, have some contingency plan to start buying up web pages. It's probably in your budget for $299. Uh, buying up web pages that you think could apply here that the bad guys might want to grab because they will and they've done it. And that, I mean, there's an explicit scenario in a, uh, a large earthquake in Chile a couple of years ago where this was done. Question, there was a, someone had their hand up? Yes. Part of a comment, um, the cyber squad was something that we, in my department, saw not long after we joined CES Mail when uh, there were targeted uh, spam campaigns where they were telling people to change their password because it was due to expire. We had switched over from our hosting our own mail, so it was a massive change in password policy storage. But it was a CES mail variety of the domain name that they had utilized. And luckily, we, our people were just fresh off of information security awareness training. Ah, so right after they came out of a session like this and they yeah. fixed that, right? Oh, good, OK. So uh, luckily for us, they reported it. We were able to see from the logs that some people clicked on the link. And yeah. so, if you, there, there was a session earlier today uh, with a woman at Deloitte who was formerly with the FBI, and she was going through a lot of these large attacks that have happened. Some have been in the press, some haven't. And almost all of them, she said, were coming from spear phishing attacks. And if I got an uh, email with a link that says, go to FolsomDam.news for more information about the disaster that's occurring you know, you know, in Sacramento today, I would probably click on it. It seems like a legitimate web page. By right? stateofcalifornia.com. Nobody, users don't go, oh, it says .com instead of .gov. It must not be, you know, that's not going to happen. Uh, and, it, and it does happen. You saw that kind of scenario as you went through that transition. So look at cyber squatting. Look at search engine poisoning. Do the cyber squatting right now, uh, but also have a contingency plan. When something does happen, it's pretty easy and cheap to just sort of buy up new other sites that might pertain to the disaster that's occurring. Question? I just Oh, this was with the uh, the Butte fire and the and the Valley fire. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's oh it's, I knew some people that were affected in Middletown. So it's it's yeah it's 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 sad to to see, but it obviously it's happening now. I did want to ah. go back to the web application firewall. Yeah. Uh, one of the offerings that the office uh, Department of Technology has in their service catalog is the National Guard can come out and do a web application vulnerability uh, assessment. Uh, the product they use, uh, the National Guard uses, is NetSparker. Uh, we took advantage of that opportunity uh, at our organization, and there were some vulnerabilities found. But Web Application uh, Firewall does a great job remediating those vulnerabilities. Of course, you know, redevelopment work might need to occur, uh, so your systems may need to uh, be re um, Yeah, it does take some tweaking. Re-engineered, but uh, Web Application Firewall is a, something that was in our we had to put in our roadmap, and we've successfully implemented that. So I've only got, we've only got about three or four minutes. One thing is protect your social media resources. Um, I did some Googling around. Lots of agencies have not just Twitter uh, and Facebook pages, but YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest, Flickr, LinkedIn and stuff. Those do get hacked. And a bad, you know, uh, you know what you can do is have two-factor authentication, require verification codes, set up your login alerts, go to Facebook, Twitter, and those things, see what you kind of can do to control security. It's weak, but it's better than nothing, and people do take advantage of it. A bad case of this was back in 2013. This was drawn from a Washington Post article. Uh, people claiming to be Syrian hackers actually 
hacked the Associated Press's Twitter feed and sent out a tweet that says, breaking two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. That shows up on the Bloomberg terminals of everybody sitting in Wall Street. The Dow dropped hundreds of points in seconds until people figured out it was a hoax. So this was a real world scenario, broken into the Associated Press, hit the stock market, $136 billion uh, were affected by that. So look at your Twitter feeds, look at all your social media, Their people will even more rely on them more than even any time as they will in the middle of, uh, of a natural disaster. Uh, a couple of other points before I close off, reduce the number of your alerts. There's technologies that can start filtering through so that you're blocking a lot of the known accounts, reducing false positives. What happened at Target was the alert actually went off. The Target account where, you know, Target stores were hacked for billion, you know, for, for, you know, changed the, the nature of the organization. Uh, the alerts went off, nobody paid attention to it. It was like a, a car alarm going off. It wasn't enough information, it wasn't happening so often they didn't even react to it. So there's technologies to filter that through. So you're only, rely, you know, you're only dealing with a couple as opposed to thousands. Uh, Gartner saying most of the big things you've read about, the alerts went off. Security systems actually sent off alerts. Nobody trusted them. And that's because there were too many false alarms. So look at the false alarm rate. Look at that. Last closing thing is look at your SSL traffic. The bad, more and more of your traffic is SSL now. And actually, Doug, you mentioned that the White House, I think it was Doug, it might have been Matthew, uh, the, there was a dictum from the White House that all federal agencies will go to HTTPS by the end of 2016. So that means any communications you're having as a state with the feds is going to be encrypted. That's good. But if you're not inspecting it, if you can't see what's inside it, it's really bad. And that's what's happening. You're not seeing the encrypted traffic. There's more and more and more and more and more encrypted traffic. And the bad guys know that and are uh, sending things back and forth for you in an encrypted tunnel. All of your security operations, all of your security technology that you spend millions of dollars for is blind. You need to be able to do this. This is a CERT recommendation. Uh, you know, US uh, computer, computer Emergency Readiness Team, strong recommendation, inspect your encrypted traffic. And don't inspect it in all of your different security devices because that's going to have a tough payload on it. It's going to have a tough performance. It. What you want to do is be able to do that in a central place and be able to have the different security devices do what they do and not have to perform that security, uh, the, encrypt the encryption function all the time. So look at centralized manner of deploying encrypted technologies. But, and this is the big but, you have to do that with privacy concerns. There are restrictions that uh, if I'm even as a corporate employee at my company and I'm communicating with my doctor, that's protected communications that cannot be uh, seen by my company. It's private. If I'm a whistleblower in the state government, federal government, that is protected communications. You want to be able to download, you know, be able to do that on a policy basis. But if I'm infected by a botnet developed by the Bulgarian mafia, and I'm sending out an encrypted tunnel from my laptop here to a Bulgarian web server somewhere in Bucharest, that's not protected communication. You want to be able to have those policies. And so my advice on looking at encrypted, uh, encrypted work, and I've had this discussion with m big corporations around the country, is talk to your legal team, determine, and they might say, no, we can't inspect encrypted traffic. The answer is, well, you know, talk about Bulgarian mafia websites and botnets and stuff like that but be able to say, okay, you can set the policies real precise so that communication to financial institutions maybe, communications with medical, communications with uh, different kinds of email and stuff like that can be inspected. And you can do that on a policy basis uh, and meet your, uh, meet your regulatory requirements, meet your legal requirements for privacy, and at the same time, inspect your encrypted traffic. It's a big, 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 big problem, and it's going to get worse. And all of your security functions, if they can't inspect the encrypted traffic, they're blind. Encryption's good. That means, all that means is nobody's looking at it in transit. That doesn't mean what's inside that encrypted pipe is any good or it's going to a good place. I mean, do you guys want to sort of expand on that as far as any, or any closing comments? Because we're right at the end of the, right. end of the session. I uh, did want to clarify on the Office of Management uh, uh, memo from the White House. That was any public-facing federal public website. Facing. Yeah, any federal-facing uh, 
website had to be uh, encrypted with so HTTPS. Uh, so um, on the uh, reverse side, yeah, we should be uh, able to determine what is the in the data side of that packet um, uh, to if there is a SSL uh, traffic. Is there a, the payload uh, in that traffic? Is it a, is it malware? And being able to decrypt that traffic is important. Yes. Um, now, if I had a solution to this problem, I'd be rich and I'd be selling the product here at the conference. But I don't. But one of the things you can throw out there as a best practice, and the DOD does it, is you do digital signatures. So regardless if you have an encrypted tunnel, that's irrelevant because you have a payload on it. You can't look into it and see once it's established in the end. But if you have a digital signature, like if you have a good PKI posture within your organization, and you have non-repudiation for one and two, you can verify that the source is legitimate. Right. So without being able to verify the legitimacy of the source, you're always going to be at risk. Right. And, that's, and there's stuff within the web, I mean, this isn't a product, there's stuff within the web gateways and stuff and da, 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 that can start to decrypt that. So yes, communication from me to Fidelity Investments, this is my, you know, my, my computer is encrypted. I have HTTPS. I don't want, you know, my, my boss <laughs> being able to see what my bank account is. But if I was going out through the gateway, it's a proxy. It goes, okay, its destination is there. Okay, no, I'm going to inspect it. I'm going to look at it. Or if it's coming from a, a bad or a weird place, not even necessarily a bad place, but a weird place, I'm going to be, that's not in the policy. I can be able to, but authentication and those kinds of things are as an imp another important piece to all this. Now, in closing, and I'm three minutes over, you know, establish the baseline. Look at how you're communicating to and from the cloud, to the cloud and for the cloud and in the cloud. Reduce the number of alerts that you're facing. There's technologies that allow you to do that. Look at emergency web access. Look at bandwidth policies. Protect your public resources. Actually, that might be the most important thing, and that's not even a blue code technology involved for the most part, is protecting your public resources, and then last but not least, manage encrypted traffic. I mean, Pan, Doug, any sort of closing comments? Oh, I do want to say I appreciate uh, having this journey with you. I, I uh, learned a lot. All right. Thank you, Pam. Thoughts? Um, train your people. Um, practice your contingency plans. Incorporate as much in this as you can. And I'm, uh, you know, so that's it for the session. Happy to take questions. Thoughts will be hanging around here at the Blue Coat booth, and I've got some of my colleagues who are over there now. We can go into a lot of gory technical details if you'd like. So appreciate it. Thanks a lot.